Okay, welcome. Um, we're excited to jump oh, right into this panel because um, the conversation seems to be percolating. And um, today we're kind of going to talk about you know, what lessons we can take from other places in the world in terms of a model um, culturally. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, before we begin, uh, I wanted to first, I think, start with what's happening here That's that we feel. Um, kind of positive about that maybe the rest of the world could pay attention to, and that seemed like a good place to begin. So, Sultan. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge what uh, Qatar, Doha have been doing over the past decade, at least. Uh, of course, all this work probably extends before that. But uh, prior to sort of Qatar kind of coming into the scene in the Middle East, we, uh, we suffered from a lack of documentation in a lot of regional uh, culture and art and uh, creativity. So, uh, for instance, over the past few years, Qatar has digitized about 500,000 documents from the British uh, Library's East India Archives. I think it's a project that costs about $14 million uh, or so. Uh, and I think it's, it, go it goes around uh, over a period of 400 years of documents. And now all these documents are available to researchers around the world. So this is one aspect. Another one is the establishment of the Islamic Museum uh, here, uh, 2008, I believe, which uh, kind of brought together for the first time a great collection of Islamic art uh, presented in an international kind of a, 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 a manner that I think is fitting to, to this collection, whereas previously it was scattered in sections in the museums. Uh, now it has a proper home. And unfortunately, after the attack that the museum in Cairo suffered uh, and has been shut down for the past two years or so, the museum in Doha is probably the most important uh, museum for Islamic art in the world. So it's just incredible that something that didn't exist is now the most important repository of, uh, 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 of Islamic art. And, and finally, uh, Metaf, which is my favorite uh, personally. So Metaf is a, uh, an important museum that brings together over 8,000 artworks from uh, the Middle East, mostly from the Arab world. Uh, this collection is invaluable. Uh, it's documented, it's in high resolution. You can access these images on Google Art Project, about a hundred or so of them, that you can keep zooming in and seeing the technique of these artists, whereas just a decade before, there was nothing available online. I mean, uh, it's just, for, for us, it, uh, you know, Metaf was a godsend. So we have a lot to be grateful for. Uh, I think even before taking a, a step onto what we can learn from others, there's so much that has been accomplished that we need to acknowledge. And also, Sultan, you were saying earlier to me that there's almost too much going on here for you to get to everything, that yes. there's just so much action, so much activity. There, there, there's conferences, I mean, especially here in Doha, there are conferences, there are talks, there are, uh, uh, there are workshops, and uh, you know, I get really angry when people come and say there's not much going on. It's just they're not really looking after, you know, they're not looking, uh, they're not keeping up with what's going on. There's, I think it's the case to be made that there's so much going on that maybe artists don't even have time to, to be creative if they're supposed to be attend all these talks. So between the, the, between the museums, the collections, the, the cultural community that's, that's, uh, that's uh, emerged here in Doha. So I've c I come here almost once or twice a month. So uh, very happy to be right. here. Sophia, you have grown up here and you keep returning. C can you talk about how you've seen it change and how you would describe the vitality of it now? Absolutely. I, th I just want to leap off of something that Sultan just said, though, about Metaf, um, which is really important is that that sort of generosity of spirit that has been a part of Doha for artists for so long um, is really showing in, in terms of, for example, the residency at the fire station. Um, and even residencies in Doha have a history because Matef, uh, when it used to be in a villa, um, had a sort of informal residency um, situation for many artists from Iraq and other places. Um, which I had the great honor of being able to look through some of the works in that when I was working at Matef, or the fruits of that, essentially. So um, I think that that hosting, like the way in which Doha hosts artists is also really important because it allows for cross-pollination um, from all over the world, but also especially from all over the region, because as Sultan says, there's um, precious few places for artists to go and work in the region and have a safe place and a, and a productive place to 
just be. So I think that that's really important. Um, in terms of the changes, my, I cannot imagine being my sister's age and seeing a Murakami show. <laughs> like, taking them to that was pretty, pretty incredible, and I think it would have changed How old my life. They? There's a whole range. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I think back to my, my own first encounters with art, and usually it was, it, you know, it, it didn't happen to be in Doha at the time. But um, the fact that it's right here on our doorstep now is, is an incredibly powerful message to the younger generation um, and generations to come. So I think that's quite, that's quite exciting. Um, and yeah, also space is opening up for dialogue. So the various galleries that are in Doha, but also all of the museums and the fact that we have all these conferences, um, not only in art, but in film and all kinds of things. So, yeah, it's a pretty, I agree with you that when people complain about there not being anything to do, it's sort of, we, we do have a saturation of information and activities and it's just a matter of being able to access it. And I think one of the big things is, is the sort of ways in which language controls your reality. So I'm able to access a lot of these things because I speak English, but um, I would like to see more accessibility in terms of language. Um, for example, for some of my younger siblings whose English is still in a middling Shake phase. Yeah. And do you see artists moving here? Would you say that that's happening and th it's a city that is sort of accommodating to artists? Well, we have a great history of, for example, um, Tayyip Saleh, the great Sudanese writer, lived in Doha. And I think that there's a, um, there are examples, um, certainly, and I would like to see more. Um, it would be wonderful if the, if the residency, for example, at the fire station, which is an incredible space and really beautiful, and the studios are absolute dream, um, an absolute dream. Um, if the residency al was also teamed with a res like residence for artists, so that that kind of cross pollination could be, um, I guess, more accessible for artists. Places to live. Yeah, exactly, because they they're pretty amazing spaces. I don't know if all of you have gone, but please do. And what about moving on to sort of other cities that this place should look to as possible models, things to emulate? Where are sort of exciting things happening um, in particular that you would call out? I'm a big fan of regionalization. I think people always talk about globalization, but I think that what we lack here in, uh, is a regionalization. The fact is that it's fine, it's great to see sort of East Asian art and uh, European and North American art, but the truth is none of these cultures are under threat. And the fact is that most of the Mid Middle Eastern culture is under threat. If you just draw a kind of three hour radius around us, almost every country is, uh, 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 culture is either under threat through negligence or war or uh, sort of uh, uh, devel development. Uh, if you think of uh, Yemen, uh, uh, Iraq, uh, uh, Syria and, 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 and elsewhere around us. And I think this, this is an opportunity for, for, for Doha, I think, to, to, place, to continue to place itself as sort of a, 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 a place where all these regions' uh, culture is not only documented and archived, but also highlighted and shared with the rest of the world. Um, but maybe just to answer your question a little bit, there's, there's, there's a few initiatives that I personally like, and most of them are based in Africa. And I, I'm a big fan of the Rencontre de Bamako, which is a, a, you know, a, a, an African photography uh, exhibition. And then you also have Addis Photo Fest, which is also a, a Biennale, but it is uh, one that is dedicated to highlighting living uh, conditions and heritage of, of Africa. One, one, uh, one other thing I would say, for, for instance, um, Tanzania has an East African biennial. So, so these are all regionalizations. Even Manifesta is a European uh, sort of uh, celebration of uh, culture and art. So I would like to see something more regional here, maybe uh, because Doha has the means and the infrastructure, something along the lines of this radius that I, that I keep dreaming of, North Africa and West Asia. I don't like to use the word Middle East because it's sort of uh, kind of European or Western-centric. Very Eurocentric, yeah. uh, So I like to use the word North Africa, West Asia. So everything from Afghanistan to East, Af to East Africa is what we uh, 
is what we probably need to highlight and protect. And I think that Doha really is, is in a prime location to do this. First of all, the demographic is, uh, uh, helps because there's people from all over this region living in, in Doha. The accessibility, the infrastructure, the logistics, everything kind of works well. So this is something I would like to see um, and maybe moving a, a bit away from globalization into the regionalization and protecting, doing what Doha did for the manuscripts in the British Library and the Islamic Museum and the, and the Arab sort of Middle Eastern Museum to sort of this region that is desperate for, for someone to protect the culture and the creativity. Sophia, you said, told me you had been reading about Zimbabwe lately, um, or that Africa was a place you were thinking about too. Can you talk about why? Uh, well, it was partially just experiential because I happen to have been in South Africa. Um, but I feel that there are conversations um, in part due to our shared history with Africa and also with various Asian countries that make cities in, um, in Africa and India uh, and generally in Asia really interesting um, locations to speak to and from. Um, I was involved in the Gwangju Biennale a few years ago, which I think you were going to mention. Um, and that was a really sort of mind-expanding experience for me, which was very much involved with the city in which it was located and um, really spending time in South Korea. So that, that kind of residency was really important. And I had this sort of, while I was in South Africa, this sort of like dream of what if there was a way to set up a residency so that artists from the Middle East could come to Johannesburg. Um, because I think that, again, I keep on using this phrase cross-pollination, but I really think that um, creativity is like a garden. I actually, I was just having a conversation with a friend of mine who's a um, landscape architect and horticulturalist about indigenous plants in the Gulf and how it's really difficult to propagate these wild plants that grew in the desert and um, therefore there are some that are very endangered. And I feel that way in terms of uh, creating or nurturing an art scene that artists and Creativity is something that isn't really quantifiable. You can't just plant a seed and expect a crop in a way. It's a sort of very complex complex ecosystem which evolves on its own. And um, Yeah, I think you said how you're never sure what's going to grow. Exactly. And, um, and so I think the circumstances in certain cities, um, for example, Detroit, we were going to talk about it, is very particular because it's affordable and um, there's, you know, time. And I think one one issue which we discussed really briefly in in Gulf cities is that most people have to have have jobs in order to be in the country. And so you'll have artists who have to do it on you know after hours instead of devoting all of their time to their work. And so. That's again, just to circle back to the residency situation, I think that that would be a really amazing um, uh, sort of fertilizer it is to have that space and time to, um, to work in a city like Doha or any of the other cities in the region. But yeah, yeah, I was struck to hear that even though you're a very successful artist, she's having a, um, she's coming to the Whitney and having a show in May and um, you are very well known. Um, you're still earning a living by screenwriting, that people don't buy video art very much, which is your primary material. I mean, how are you making it work? You're living m between London and here. Um, it's, it's difficult, would you say, to... I think that um, collectors still don't really know what to do with video art, but I'm grateful that there have been some... Um, I mean, I've, I've had some amazing patrons. So um, I'm quite lucky in that respect. But I do continue to have a day job. And, but I'm lucky in that that day job cross-pollinates my own work because I'm doing research about historical moments, both in the Middle East and all over the world. And it's, um, and it's yielded some very interesting experiences which inform uh, my artwork. So absolutely. But I, I do think that it's important to take um, one's ability to support oneself into consideration in this conversation 
in terms of creative cities. We were talking about how you can't even afford Brooklyn now, where the artists were going. Um, Sultan, can you talk a little bit about what your foundation is doing and, and to what extent it might relate to some of this? So I, I come from the generation that has been inspired by people like Sheikh Hassan Al Thani here in, uh, in Doha. So Sheikh Hassan, if, for those who don't know him, is a patron of the art here in, in the Middle East and in the Gulf, sort of a super, like superhero, because it, in some cases, literally, because he saved so much art and culture, and paintings and sculptures that would have been lost had he not stepped in and, and kind of brought them and saved them and put them here in Doha. Doha became, thanks to Sheikh Hassan, and Sheikh Hamayasa, of course, and, 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 the, and the, um, the umbrella sort of uh, environment uh, provided by Sheikh Hamad and Sheikh Moza, their highnesses, is that um, it allowed all this Iraqi treasures that would have been lost to be housed here, documented and researched, opened up to uh, academics and scholars. And to be honest with you, I think, and I go out on a limb here, and I say that the greatest collection of Iraqi art in the world is here in Doha. So if you want to see the greatest collection of Iraqi art, you know, if you ever make it to Baghdad, uh, you probably won't be able to see it because it probably is here. So, um, so th there is this environment that that exists in Doha, but but also, and I kind of forgot your question, where because <laughs> yes, it was just about kind of we were talking about livable, you know, the kind of the, the sustainability of being an artist and how difficult that might be. I mean, do you find yourself trying to sort of support artists in the kind of pursuit of yes. their? Yes, yes, of course. So we're very proud to be showing uh, Sophia's work at the White Chapel Gallery. One or two works, I can't remember. I think there's two. Two works. So we're showing two of Sophia's works at the White Chapel Gallery. Is it uh, in the next few months? So if you make it to London, please visit the show uh, and to see Sophia's work. And uh, no. so, <laughs> again, because we're inspired by people like Sheikh Hassan, we started buying some of whatever was left, really, in the market uh, of Middle Eastern artworks and sharing it with the rest of the world. So we, we have sort of a foundation with about a thousand artworks, contemporary and modern. And we, uh, we do exhibitions around the world, including in Toronto and in London and in Singapore, uh, inshallah, and uh, in Doha one day soon. But if it isn't for people like uh, Sophia, the art won't be interesting and people won't come. But in, our, you know, in one of our last shows, we had 60,000 visitors in our Toronto show come to our exhibition. So there is interest in something that isn't negative about the Middle East. Because uh, so you turn on the news and it's all negative. But, but there is so much positivity going on here in Doha, in Qatar, and other places in the region. Uh, you know, thanks to Sheikh Al Mayasa, thanks to, thanks to uh, Sophia, and the entire team, to be honest with you, in the QMA and, the, and all the other institutions here. I w I've been reading Sophia's memoir, which I would commend to all of you. It's really quite wonderful. Um, she talks about growing up between here and the U.S. Um, can you give us a little bit of a sense of kind of what that experience was like for you, kind of reliving that and telling it, and, and kind of what was your sort of motivation behind doing that? Um, sure. The <laughs> um, I don't want to give any spoilers, <laughs> as the, um, the, the book is very much dedicated to illuminating that experience, which I think um, a lot of, is, is a more and more common experience. I wrote that book for individuals who feel sort of uh, as if they are expected to be a bridge between two different places, two different cultures, two different languages. So it was very much for the Canadian kid whose family are from Hong Kong or for the uh, Palestinian kid who's grown up in France or where, whatever it might be. Um, but also, I wrote it because I, I really, um, I wrote it in part for a Western audience who misunderstood, um, who I felt was misunderstanding my own experiences in, in the Gulf. And, um, and so, yeah, the um, process was harrowing, um, sort of sifting back through one's, um, admittedly, it's a bit strange to be my age and have written a memoir, but um, and um, to sift through one's relatively recent experience and find a way in which to, um, I guess, mythologize it. Because as, I mean, Oran Pamuk has this quote, which I've always loved, which is that with memoir, 
I think with painting, it's about symmetry, but with memoir, it's not about the, the, it's not about the truth of, of the story, but it is about, about the aesthetics and the symmetry of it. And um, therefore, in the book, for example, I turn to uh, constellations and the way in which navigation has always been very much a, um, a beautiful part of, um, I guess, the Islamic sciences. So astrology, uh, astronomy, and, um, and so yeah, the book is very much about finding one's place on this very small planet. You were telling me that you include a very sweet story in which Her Excellency figures prominently. Do you want to maybe share that? It's such a, a great um, anecdote. Yes, in the, in the, in the book um, I share a story about my high school um, graduation process. Um, I wasn't uh, going to be able to graduate because of the tuition fees at the American school and one of the teachers there suggested that I write a letter and that letter um, thankfully was received by Sheikh Moza and she um, personally saw to it that I was able to graduate so I, I definitely um, am, am, I am forever grateful What did for you say in the letter? I don't remember to be honest and I wish I still had it, <laughs> a copy of it but it, it was very heartfelt and it was all very true. So, yeah. That's great. They say, you said they came to your house to make sure that you actually existed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was, a, there was a lovely lady who came and sat with my grandmother and I, yeah. It was, I think, unusual on, in the world that that kind of thing is possible. Yes, so. that's an amazing story. Let's go to questions, if we have any. Um, I see one in, right there. Thank you very much for this uh, amazing panel discussion. I have a question for Sophia. I was extremely happy to um, hear you talk about landscape architecture and uh, horticulture. And I was wondering if you also see that as an opportunity for living art display here in Qatar particularly. We talk about connectivity, we talk about um, preserving native species and things like this and really making this in an actual place, but we also have um, to live with the forever changed ecosystem that we created with all of the new uh, buildings that we built around the desert. So there's an, uh, a fragile walk perhaps uh, within this desert environment to make things green, but by reusing water that is not coming directly from desalination, things like this. But is there a chance to actually use landscape architecture as a way of green infrastructure to connect and to provide places that have been actually part of the um, heritage and culture in Islam by providing places for people to congregate and to exchange ideas. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really hope that there is a place for that. I mean, uh, from the gardens that are on roundabouts to, I mean, the roundabout is a funny example because obviously it's almost impossible to walk to one unless you're going to risk your life running across a crowded roundabout. But um, I think that there are a few um, initiatives to, for example, connect some of the new uh, shopping centers and sort of have walks between places. Um, it's funny, as we were, we were discussing walking earlier and right that's always I was something people bring where up. do you kind of stroll here yeah it, it's it's an urban it's an it's a it's a question which is relevant to this conference obviously because it is about cities um, but to be honest there there's a combination of things obviously um, and I'm not a landscape architect <laughs> so I wouldn't know but I uh, I love I love the planet and greenery as much as the next person so I hope that there will be. Okay, over here. Uh, hi. Mm -hmm. My question is to Mr. Sultan. Like, um, since you are like kind of familiar with this region, like when it comes to the selection of the artwork uh, to be showcased and the galleries that you have, um, 
and especially like I will use Qatar as like study case like the population here in Doha like not like uh, the Western or like the expat community here larger than our local community um, is that an effect for you to select which kind of art pieces will you will put in the gallery considering the uh, kind of need or like the kind of the art industry kind of require um, first of all, I think that the fact that Doha hosts so many people from around the world is an advantage. I don't look at it in any way as a disadvantage. I think this is globalization here. This is where people grow up and interact with uh, you know, people from Africa and Asia and, and Europe and elsewhere. Uh, so, uh, and the second thing is that all the works that are chosen are not chosen by me. They're chosen by professionals. Your work was not chosen by me. It was chosen by, chosen by the curators. So this is a testimony to the, the quality of the work that's being produced. And, uh, and I think a great artwork is one that stands its ground. You can't really tell it's a, it's a, West, a West Asian artist, North African artist, it's just a great artist. So Sofia's work is just a great artwork. It's not a great artwork by a Qatari, it's a, or a Middle Eastern, or an Arab, or a Gulf. It's just a great artwork. And I think that is the testimony that, 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 uh, uh, that speaks for itself. Okay, right there in the blue. She's right behind you there. I wanted to ask you, how is the relationship <coughs> between the, uh, you as an artist as in, and, and the local uh, collectors? Myself? Yes. Uh, I've uh, absolutely... Um, actually, most, uh, most of my work has been collected by uh, Qatari collectors and... Um, regional collectors. So um, I'm very well, I mean, I've, I feel that there is a very strong support. Um, I would like to see, I think, maybe more from my colleagues or I guess other artists, maybe. Um, but I can only speak subjectively to my own experience, which has been extremely positive and extremely, um, um, I've been very well supported in terms of local collectors. Um, I hope that answers your question. Okay, yes. My question is for Sophia. I wanted to ask as an artist, um, being partly based here, how do you deal with censorship? Um, I think censorship is, in an odd way, sometimes an advantage for an artist because it forces one to be um, creative. <laughs> frankly. So sometimes restraints, um, you know, you don't write a poem and fill the whole page. You have to have, use the tools that you have to um, craft something which fits the meter. And I think um, uh, I think that that answers the question. It hasn't been an obstacle for you. Sorry? It has not been an obstacle for you. Uh, um, no, although there, there is sometimes a bit of a mystery. Um, I, my very first artwork was actually shown at the Qatar, or I mean at the Sukhwagif Art Center, um, one of my early video works in the early 2000s. And it was of two children playing on a roof and inexplic inexplicably in a group show it was, um, removed, but it was a mystery to the owner of the gallery and everyone. So it's, 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 um, but that was a long time ago and the reasons are perhaps, um, might be clearer now, I'm not sure, but it's, um, yeah, it, it didn't affect me badly because it was a, um, it was seen for those few brief moments, and that was important to me. Sultan, do you see this as an issue at all? Censorship? Um, I'm surprised with what we got away with, to be honest with you. So I'm not going to talk about it too much so nobody notices. <laughs> 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 OK. Anyone else? Yes, back there. Um, uh, my name is Ali Yellow from Professor of Architecture and Urban Design here in Qatar. And thank you so much for an inspiring talk. But, uh, I just need to relate it back to the issue of Doha as a creative city and, and the importance of museum in establishing this. And uh, 
we talked in the last two or three days about the notion of the museum as a sort of an icon, and then we talked about the content of the museum, and then it seems to me that there is something unique about Doha, which is how the context of the museum is encouraging people to visit. And, and it seems to me, and I want to use the presence of Sophia and Sultan because they're presenting also the regional and the local perspective. We don't have that much the museum goers tradition in this part of the world. And therefore, it seems to me that the context of the museum is fundamentally important. And I would, I would relate this to the case of uh, Qatar Museum of Islamic Art. And I think Sheikh Amayas is doing a wonderful job. Uh, and precisely when it comes to the notion of the park and people going to the park, and therefore going to museum is becoming a sort of a byproduct, but yet this is an excellent way to encourage people to, to visit and to enjoy the museum. So my very basic question is that part of this notion of the creative city, it, means, it seems to me like inviting uh, uh, innovation and creativity when it comes to how to relate people to the components of the creative city. Thank you so much. And Sultan? So uh, you have to keep in mind that in the Middle East, museums are under threat. They're either shut down the, uh, for, you know, there's terrorists kind of trying to bomb them. There, there's lack of financial uh, support. There is lack of documentation. And as museums are under threat in some parts of the region, in Doha, they're flourishing. In Doha, they're opening. They, they, there's the Islamic Museum. There's the, Ori there's the Orientalist collection. There's the, uh, the Middle Eastern sort of Arab collection. There's, there's so all sorts of museums that I won't even go into right now, but, but uh, uh, maybe this is a plug for a collection of articles that I curated for the conference on the emergence of, of cities like uh, Doha. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at that. But no doubt, one thing I will say, and this might be privileged information, I'm not, I apologize to my friends in Madhav for sharing this, but as I understand, the most popular show Madhav ever put together was the one that showcased Qatari artists, Sualif. Um, I don't know if you, if, uh, is, this, is this correct? So there is an interest in, uh, in, in Qatari <coughs> and, and uh, you know, local art. Uh, I am not worried at all about the movie going uh, generation, uh, sorry, the, the museum going uh, generation because you know, we take, we t we, uh, these kids are, are growing up, uh, as uh, Sophia just mentioned, with the culture of visiting museums now, whereas just 10, 15 years ago, none existed, or very few existed. Okay, From thank all you. going to museum going generation, yeah. change. Uh, we're out of time, thank you to you both, thank you all. Thank you.